Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This for UFC Vegas 21. I'm Paul Shaughnessy, joined by the power of Zoom by Cody Safdick. How's it going, Cody? Yeah, Zoom, connecting people in these godforsaken times. And yeah, yeah, happy to be joined on the show, Paul. But too bad we can't do it in the studio. It's a beautiful day out. Hopefully the weather keeps up good. And uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully we'll be in studio next week. A hundred percent. Yeah, this this studio is hot, runs hot at the best of times. You know that. So it's uh, it's getting a little steamy. I may have to disrobe a little bit. Uh, um, yeah, make sure that uh, you hit the like button, do all that good stuff this week. All the things that Pat usually says and reminds me to say. I think there's like a podcast feed, Mayo Media Network, The Mix. Go subscribe That's to right. that. That's where you'll see like audio feeds for Brett Apley's video, Mad Lab's video. We're on the regular, or we're on our regular Dogger Pass feed. All of that good stuff. Like, subscribe, tell a friend. You know, all of that stuff. Let's just get into the action. What do you say? Yeah, sounds good to me. All right, we got Bilal Muhammad taking on uh, Leon Edwards. Leon Edwards, the favorite at minus two sixty. Bilal Muhammad can be had. Four plus two twenty. Take it away, Cody. Yeah, well, I'm liking Leon Edwards. I think that the price is pretty good here too. And the problem with Leon Edwards is, and I'm in on the joke too. I honestly think it's kind of funny. It's like everyone's got this thing where they just love to discredit him. They love to. They love when his fights fall out. They love that this and that. They love bashing on Leon Edwards. He, he's got a tremendous amount of skill. His problem is, is that he's super avoided. Nobody wants to fight him. He doesn't bring anything to the table in terms of a big name opponent. He doesn't bring any in anything to the table in terms of a ton of exposure and it's just a really tough fight it's not going to be a super sexy fight knocking him out is very difficult <clears throat> you know probably not going to happen submitting him is very difficult probably not going to happen what is more likely is these grinding type affairs where it's a lot of clinch battle it's a lot of you know up against the cage it's a lot of single strikes at distance not a, not a, not exactly the most exciting fight going so for a lot of these fighters they don't want to fight him it's going to be a tough fight if I lose to him, it's going to throw me right at the bottom of the rankings. And if even if I do manage to beat this guy, it's going to be a hell of a war. You know, it's going to take a lot of an effort to beat him. And the fans are still not really going to respect it because it's just going to be one of those fights. So as a result, nobody signs in the dotted line to fight Leon Edwards. He doesn't really fight all that much. When he does fight, it's been a lot of guys that are either no longer with the promotion or kind of at their tail end of their career. You know, a Rafael Dos Anjos his last time out, a Donald Cerrone, a, even a Gunnar Nelson, who I guess hasn't really had much success in the last few years. But he can go out there and get the victory over the age guy, but none of these guys in their prime want to fight him anymore. Yeah, he's already lost to Koro Usman, which makes it a very tough sell for the UFC to give this guy a title fight, but he's on an eight-fight winning streak since then. <clears throat> Colby Covington doesn't want to fight him. None of these guys want to fight him. So now you've got Kazat Chimaev, right? Kamza, nobody wants to fight Chimaev. Nobody wants to fight Leon Edwards. Makes sense to pair them up together. And Leon's is in, man. Leon's in. He knows this is a shot. He's 29 years old. He's in the prime. You see anything about this guy online, he's in freakishly good shape. And he's taking it super seriously, and there's a really lot that you can like about his game. He does everything well. You know, as far as the striking goes, he's quick, he's accurate, he's got a good jab, good right hand down the middle, you know, good range kicks, not a ton of power, but a good striking arsenal. As far as his ground game goes, if he ends up on top, he's got good top control, good submission defense, good pace, good cardio, and where he really shines is the clinch. You know, he's a guy that exits with a strike, usually an elbow, um, but he does a good job of like striking in the clinch, keeping busy, just outworking his opponent a little bit. With Bilal Muhammad, Bilal Muhammad's never been in a UFC main event. He's been fighting a run of the mill of, you know, top 30 guys, like not exactly, you know, household names himself. And this is a great spot for him to step up on short notice and jump into a main event. So he's game. He, you know, he's a badass. He's willing to jump up. He's willing to do something that some of the top five and top 10 guys don't want to do against Leon Edwards. But that doesn't change the fact that he's outgunned here. Now, they do kind of match up a little bit similar in that Bilal Muhammad wants to do the same thing. You know, he's more of a grinder. He doesn't have a ton of strikes, but he's got good strikes from the outside. He likes to get into the clinch. He likes to wear on you. He's got great cardio. So as far as this fight matches up, it does match up pretty similar. But I think Leon Edwards is just a little more refined. His striking is a little sharper. It's a little bit crisper. He's had the higher level experience. Um, cardio is probably par on both sides. But again, Edwards is in fantastic shape. Five rounds, I would think, should favor towards him. You know, the, the grappling is just a, a slight advantage towards Leon Edwards. Blah Muhammad is dangerous, but he's not dangerous in like a one-shot knockout ability or or a real quick submission. He's dangerous in that he'll just go tit for tat with you, but I don't expect Leon uh, to, to, to fail if that becomes the case. So, I mean, good fight. We love that Bilal Muhammad stepping up to, so that he can actually put this thing together. 
But uh, ultimately, uh, yeah, I like Leon Edwards. Like, as, again, as far as his skill set goes and what he shows and what he presents and all th that, I mean, I I I'm behind this guy. It's just whether Blah Muhammad can figure that over the course of five, and I don't think he's going in this case. So I got, I got uh, Leon Edwards. Now, again, looking at the money line, not great. I think it's minus 260, which, I again, as I said at the top, don't think that's a bad price, but it is minus 260. But you really got to factor in this thing's getting rounds in. And they all, the bookmakers on that as well. I mean, you look at the over three and a half rounds, it's high. Even fight goes a distance, like minus 180, it's high. But, uh, but I think Leon Edwards would grind him out, win these rounds, presumably win a decision. And then I think that is like plus 125. So now you can get a plus money play on Edwards. Um, but you got to hope that this thing goes five rounds. So anyway, the play is Edwards. I will take Edwards by decision as well. I think that Malal, Blah Muhammad is durable. Um, but I think he just, you know, is, is slightly going to be a little ahead of him. In, in all the, the elements of MMA. So he should be able to squeak it through. Yeah, honestly, you kind of take most of the words out of my mouth there. Uh, the really, the only thing that really separates them, I mean, I think Leon Edwards is the is the better athlete. But the, the big thing is, yeah, he's got like a three-inch reach advantage. He's not very easy to hit. Um, in terms of significant strikes and how these, how these guys usually fight, like Bilal Muhammad does have like the higher ceiling. Like last fight... Out against Diego Lima, landed 129 significant strikes in three rounds of action. But the problem is Leon Edwards just isn't there to get hit, um, like like Diego Lima was in that spot. I like Edwards to win too. I think I think the line is more or less right in this situation. And then yeah, the over four and a half rounds. It's like that's a long time to be playing, uh, to be uh, to be fighting. Obviously, um, Muhammad hasn't been finished at, or finished since taking on. Uh, Vicente Luque uh, way back when he's pretty durable obviously he could get knocked out like it just seems like a straight up pass based on the odds makers more or less getting it right but I think Leon Edwards wins maybe I'll throw him on a parlay at some point this week but nothing I'm too excited about we move on to the co-main event we have Misha Shirkinov taking on Ryan Superman Span minus 140 Shirkinov Plus 120 for Span. Over-under is set to one and a half rounds, which the over is uh, plus 110, over one and a half rounds. Under one and a half rounds, minus 140. Uh, I think the play here, maybe you can debate with me, is like that under is just screaming. It's minus 140 at most books. Seen it minus 150 at other places. But I think Shirkinov just kind of fights a certain way now. He just... Goes out there, he tries to take you down, like, immediately. He's fishing for a submission. I'm not entirely sure uh, how good Span's grappling is. I know he's got a couple of submissions on his resume, and I don't know. I think he'll be well-equipped and well-prepared for this type of matchup. Like, we know what Shurkinov does, but Shurkinov's so strong when he gets you into those positions that it's uh, curtains usually when he gets down there. The guy hasn't been out of the first round since 2016, I want to say. I don't have, like, I can't look at the yeah, stats yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he hasn't been out of the round since 2016. You're right. It just seems like you could either bet one of the sides here, but that under is just begging me to hammer it. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you're, I'm looking at the under as well. You pretty much nailed it perfectly. He's not only have his last six fights ended inside of the first round, but he's had nine fights in the UFC, all of which have ended inside the distance, seven of which have ended inside of the first round. So if Misha Cherkinov gets you to the ground, this has always been the, the book on him, right? Because you and I have been following this guy long before he ever made it to the UFC, but his black belt uh, is probably, you know, his grappling is amongst the best at 205 pounds. Mm -hmm. If this is a straight grappling match, Misha Cherkinov beat all of these guys at 205 pounds. He's very, very technical. He's very, very advanced. Unfortunately, and we do see this time and time again, it's like jiu-jitsu is not everything. And so how, do, how are the rest of Misha Cherkinov's skills? Well, he's a judo black belt. He's a guy that wrestled on like the Canadian national team for a little bit. Uh, he does have some wrestling, but he's stiff as a board. And you've seen that through a lot of his early careers. It's like he just doesn't move particularly well. He doesn't strike particularly well. But at, eventually, at some point, he does relocate to Extreme Couture in Las Vegas full time. He spends all of his time in Vegas now. And you do see the striking getting better. But it's not great, man. He's still unbelievably stiff as a board. But if he gets this fight to the ground, I mean, he's going to cause big problems for people, right? Is just striking improving? Yeah. Are some elements of his game improving? Yeah. But ultimately, is like his bread is butter is the grappling. Get on top of these guys and try to submit them. That is what's going to save him. His last fight against Jimmy Crude, he came out and he looked like, you know, a reinvented version. Of, not a reinvented version. He did exactly what he should do. He got the takedown over Jimmy Crude. He's smashing on Jimmy Crude. 
It's only a matter of time. And all of a sudden, Crute sweeps and ends up on top. And Jimmy Crute starts putting a beating on him. And so then that's the second part of Misha that comes out. It's like when he doesn't establish a, a strong top control, when he doesn't get his way with you, it's like he can't crumble a little bit. You can't knock him out. You can't put pressure on this guy. You can't break him. In the crew fight, he's getting beat up. And then what do you know? He slaps on just the nastiest um, Peruvian necktie to get the submission. We haven't seen him in a year and a half since. He's 34 years old. This, is, this doesn't scream like, oh, man, like better, better version's going to come. Super excited. It does scream ring rust. Again, 34. And he really needs to establish this top control. But they give him a pretty, you know, a winnable fight in Ryan Spin. And that can he get Ryan Spin down? Yeah, he can. And if he does get him down, he's got good ground and pound as well. He could set something up with the submission. And again, one of these guys that doesn't need a whole lot of space to submit you. But when we're talking about this under one and a half, either Misha goes, gets that takedown, ends up on top, and he smashes him, or he doesn't. And if he doesn't, Brian Ryan Spain's a much better kickboxer. He's got the striking. He can put a good bit of a, a pressure on you for the first couple rounds. Both guys don't have great cardio. You've seen with, with Ryan Spain um, getting tired in the Sam Alvey fight late, almost losing the Sam Alvey fight, arguably. And with Misha, I mean, he hasn't been outside of the first round in four and a half years, so... Does that scream that this guy's got second and third round cardio? No. So you basically, whatever side you're taking, it's the assumption of like the other guy's game plan is not going to come through here and I've got a minute and a half to work with. That's why the under, like you said, I think is the, is the play for this one. I think I am going to lean towards Ryan Spann just in that, you know, hopefully he catches Misha on his feet. If he mm-hmm. does get taken down, he's got to get back up. But again, it's like you've you got to cause Misha to work. Once Misha works and he gets tired, then he doesn't move a lot. Once he doesn't move a lot, he's quick, agile guys with, you know, the long reach, state of the outside, beat him with the punch. They're going to find those openings. And he doesn't wear damage very well. Like, he gets hit and he shies up a bit. He's a guy that hasn't been hit a whole lot in his career. He generally gets you down and has his way. Um, but I think at this point, he's been exposed at the highest level. Ryan Spann isn't the highest level. So this is a winnable fight for him, no doubt. But if I had to flip the coin on which side, I'm leaning towards Ryan Spann. Re- and, and the under one and a half, I'm thinking if it was going to be Spann, it would be Spann TKO inside the distance. But I think to cover it on both sides, in case Misha does have his way and put on a great performance, that under one and a half, you know, that's all. That's all. Seven and a half minutes is all Misha needs, right? Either way. Small cage, too. Um, you know, that is either going to help Misha to get the takedown really early or, you know, if he doesn't get that takedown early, he'll start to look really desperate and, and Span should be able to exploit him on the feet. Like you're saying, yeah, that's what I was saying. Like, uh, gun to my head, if I have to pick in this spot, I'll go with you. All fights start on the feet, so I'll go with Span, who I think has the better, uh, the better kickboxing. But yeah, the under is the same price as Shurkinov. That's that's the bet for me on this fight. All right, we move on. We've got Dan Ige taking on Gavin Tucker, minus one fifty Ige, plus one thirty for Gavin Tucker. Who you got here, Cody? Oh, this one pains me, right? So basically, this is the way it shakes out. Not exactly a ton of top-level fighters in Canada right now. Yeah, we got George St. Pierre. We ain't ever going to let that one go. We had Rory McDonald. He seemed to be like the heir to the throne and then, uh, you know, didn't work out. He's kind of middling in Bellator. Then he goes to PFL and, you know, who knows? Things just didn't really work out. And then beyond that, it's like we got nothing. We got nothing. Long gone are the days of having, you know, a few guys in every division. Um, you know, the Patrick Cotes of the world, guys that at least hang as fringe contenders. It's like, we don't get any of that. So when you get someone like Gavin Tucker, or did we talk about in the last fight, Misha Chirkin up, technically Latvian, but we take him as our own. It's like, you root for these guys. You really want them to do good. Gavin Tucker's with, is within three guys that I think are legitimate, you know, top 15, top 10 talents in the UFC, that being Hakeem Dawadu. Jeremy Kennedy's not in the UFC, but I do think he's legit. And Gavin Tucker. So like, yo, we root for these guys. We want them to get the win. We want them to get these spots. But this is a tough go. And I like, I hate to fade two Canadians back to back here, going against Misha Cherkinov and then going against Gavin Tucker. But again, very winnable fight for Gavin Tucker. I just think that Dan Ige's probably, listen, the striking advantage is going to go to Gavin Tucker, right? He's got a better jab. He's got better technical boxing. He's good from the outside. He's got good kick game. I would give him that technical advantage. Gavin Tucker is also a BJJ black belt. Dan Ige, BJJ black belt. Let's say that kind of nullifies itself, right? So does Danny Ige just take this fight down routinely and it becomes a grappling match? Or does Gavin Tucker keep the fight standing and pick him apart? Gavin Tucker's wrestling is actually pretty good. It's not something that you exactly see because he hasn't fought a whole lot of high-level wrestlers and has, hasn't had to show that takedown defense. But again, it's something that he has in his back pocket. And you see him, he's fluid. He's a good striker. Like He could present a lot of problems, right? The Billy Carantillo fight, I really thought Billy would eventually get the fight to the ground. When Billy did get the fight to the ground, i would be a little more grappler versus grappler, and Billy would hold his own. At the very least, Billy would tire him out because he just always has a hectic pace and he would break him down. 
with Gavin Tucker, man, again, you see, you just that was a that was probably a career best performance for him, and that Billy brought out the best of him. You know, the guy is a great striker. His cardio, pretty good. His, his grappling, pretty good. He can tie everything together, and he is physically strong for the featherweight division. So, does he have a path to victory over Danny? Absolutely. Use your that strength, use that physicality, keep this fight standing, outpoint him. But I look, I think when you look at his run, it's like he takes that light, he, his wins, of course, he wins his debut against Sam Cecilia, no longer with the promotion, and then he takes that life altering beating against Rick Glenn, who's a non-factor with the promotion. Still signed to the promotion. Hasn't fought in a few years, but, you know, it was a bad beating against Rick Glenn. Coming back, it's like, man, this guy's just looked like a completely different fighter. Strange in that, you know, he is 34 years old, right? He's coming up on his 35th birthday, you know, but, but he made a ton of improvements. But he beats Sung Wung Choi. Nice little win. Not a top 15 guy. Beats Justin James. Not a great win, but, you know, still got one out there. Got hurt, but goes out there, gets the third round submission. And then the Billy win, that's a great win for him. But Billy, you know, as much as I like him, he's, he's not a top 20 guy. With Dan Ige, it's like Dan Ige has been fighting Calvin Cater and Edson Barbosa, and he's been in there, and he's been hurt, and he's been experiencing, you know, adversity and all these different things at the highest level. You know, we talk about guy managed by Ali Abdelaziz, but putting him up in a, in a, in a great path to win. The Edson Barbosa fight, whether a lot of people scream robbery or not, it was a good, it, it was a good showing for him that he got hurt bad in that first round, but he persevered. He kept coming at him. He kept trying to break him down. He showed that will. It looked like he'd be built for five rounds. Then he gets a Calvin Cater fight. You know what I mean? Because I took a ton of shit on that fight. <laughs> I was wrong. I, I had Dan Ige. This is a guy that can persevere through five rounds. Go. He got beat up in the first round. I thought he won the second round. Gave a good account of himself. And then the volume from Cater just took over and ate him up. Is Gavin Tucker Calvin Cater? Is he going to box him up for 25 minutes? Or sorry, for this is only a three-round fight. Is he going to box him up for... 15 minutes is he going to be that much clearer that or is Dan Ige going to get some of these takedowns grind him a little bit you know put a put a bit of a more of a pace on him that's kind of how I see this one going I have it going to decision I got the over I got Dan Ige by decision again not the most confident and I hate going against Team Canada here um but I think it's a it's a cl- similar to the main event both guys match up kind of similar they had striking advantage towards Tucker obviously but both guys have a lot of paths to victory. They can win this fight, but it's going to bank rounds, I think. So whoever wins is probably going to win by decision. Not super confident on it, but I'm going to go Ige, Ige by decision. I can't really add too much to that. I think Ige, Ige, Ige by decision is the play in this spot as well. I mean, Gavin Tucker took an absolute hellacious beating against Rick Glenn all, uh way back when. And Dan Ige has been in there with some of the best guys in the world. Guy's super, super durable as well. I mean, the over is uh, over is minus 260 on the over two and a half rounds. Pretty juiced in that situation. Let's see what uh, Ige, by decision, just trying to pull it up on the... Why is... Uh, best fight odds always makes it... The, the, uh, the order is always out of, out of whack. Uh, what we got here? Ige, by decision, plus 140, plus 150... I like it. Let's, let's, uh, yeah, I'm going to write that down. Get in on the action. Ige by decision, plus 150. Get it in you. All right, we got Jonathan Martinez taking on Davy Grant, minus 305 Martinez, plus 255 for your boy, Davy Grant. Uh, this line seems super, super wide to me. Um, uh, is there method to this madness or? Is uh, is it a dog or pass type of situation here? No, I think there's a method to the madness. Jonathan Martinez is 26 years old. He looks the part. He's been getting better and better since he's come to the UFC. This is a guy that debuted with a loss to Andre Sukumtas, so not exactly riveting stuff. And, you know, he wasn't exactly filled out at 135. It was his debut. He didn't look great, but it looked like his striking was certainly there. And then they give him a few layups. He beats Wuji Buren. He beats Pinyu Liu. It's like, okay, he's getting a couple wins in the UFC. He loses to Andre Ewell, but big robbery, man. And I think that was his really coming out party in that Ewell is a fringe top 20 guy, top, you know, not top 15, but top 20 guy. Always gives a good account of himself. Long, good jab, good boxing, been rounds with good guys. It's like he's a good barometer test. And in that fight, you know, he did technically get outstruck a little bit, but I, I thought he won the fight. Most people thought he won the fight. You know, he had the pressure. And again, I just think that this is a young athletic guy developing, putting his skills together. Striking still is his primary foundation, but you're going to have to get this guy to, to the ground and out of his element, or is he, he's, he's dynamic, he's flashy, he can land something at any point. 
following it up, he gets Frankie Signs. Well, there you go. Here's an old-timey, grindy wrestler, you know, former Arizona State University wrestler. Old-timey. Uh, likes to get the fights in the ground. <laughs> he's definitely old-timey. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's going to try. He's going to attempt to get this thing down. And Jonathan Martinez, who's the flashy young striker, is probably susceptible to one of these, like, KG old experienced guys. But in that spot, it's like, man, this guy's making improvements. First of all, we knew he was going to have a speed advantage, but he was just like night and day faster than him. He beat him with a punch. He beat him up. And then to finish him with a flying knee in the third round, it was like he's dangerous throughout. His cardio is good throughout. And he's got good vision. You know, he's seeing these strikes through. So now they book him with Thomas Almeida. Now, here's another very tough spot. They're not doing this kid any favors. He's still young and they're moving him along. They're not giving him the easiest fights, but he's looking good. Now, he comes in as an underdog against Thomas Almeida by virtue of it is Thomas Almeida, and he's coming off a long absence. But here's a guy that fought Cody Garbrandt, was a a three to one favorite over Cody Garbrandt once upon a time. This is supposed to be a you know a hyped prospect. And what you see in that fight is they're both young, they're both strikers, but it's like it's like new age versus old school. Tom Salmeno fights like an old school shooter box guy. He plants his feet, his head doesn't move, his hands are relatively low, and he plods forward. Martinez just darts around this guy and picks him apart. You know, wins the unanimous decision, wins a comfortable decision, and again now you now you've got this kid, twenty six years old. And he's, he's accruing good, you know, experience, solid experience, invaluable experience in octagon time. I, I just think that he, his career clearly trending for him. Now, Davy Grant, Paul, if you know anybody who's in on Davy Grant, it'd be me. But, like, Davy Grant's best days are behind him, you know? He was supposed to be real a standard on The Ultimate Fighter. Didn't really pan out that way. He's come to the UFC. He's had an absolute mixed bag of success. But ultimately, they've tried to test him against these somewhat upper echelon guys and he come he doesn't come through it's mostly against grapplers which is crazy because davy grant himself is a grappler yet his losses chris holds with damian stasiak and manny bermudas all three times he was submitted those are his losses Mm -hmm. his wins let's let's take a uh let's not we want to talk about the marlon vera fight because that skews things you're like oh fucking dude he beat marlon vera right but it's like ah it was a long time ago and the fight was kind of a strange one you got to look at like the recency because that's the thing about him from 2016 to 2018, no fights, right? Didn't fight for two, almost two years. Loses, takes a year and a half off, beats Gregory Popov, very one-dimensional Muay Thai guy, and then he beats Martin Day. The Martin Day fight was competitive, but again, Martin Day, Taekwondo, black belt, didn't have the cardio, didn't have the, bur- the durability, and Davy Grant should have just gone out there and taken this guy down, right? The easiest path to victory against Martin Day, and you that was very, very clear and evident in his last fight, is just take this guy down, right? And yet Davy Grant, not super successful with the ground game. He had to go forward, pressure this guy, tire him out, and make it a sloppy striking affair in order to eventually get that uh, third-round knockout himself. So, like, what's what's the avenue here against Jonathan Martinez? Go back to the wrestling, take this guy down. But if he's not able to do it, he will be plodding forward, similar to a Thomas Almeida. He's flat-footed. His head's kind of on the center line. And he will be just marching forward. And I think small cage or not, they're only 135 pounds. It's not going to make a difference. Martinez is just going to dance around him and beat him with a punch. Um, now, here's a fight that I'm not 100% sure on, like, the inside, the distance, or by decision. I would like to say this can be Martinez by decision. I'd like to say he just stays to the outside and outpoints him. But with Grant, like, his cardio is not as good as it used to be. Again, he's also someone, lots of inactivity. But now he's coming in, he's, he's 35 years old. 35 at Bantamweight is not exactly a, a, a great thing. So it's a clear narrative. You have 26-year-old Martinez, striker, dynamic on his way up, you've got the 35-year-old Davy Grant grappler on his way down. Uh, you know that that screams in itself, Martinez. Three to one line, you can't love, but you tape study it more and more. And it, Martinez is just the better skilled fighter, so I do have him. I I'm not sure which way I'm going to go on a prop on that one. That one's kind of still undecided. Betting it straight up at three to one, you can't really do that. So is he parlay material? I think so, but. You know, is he our apple pie shitter of the week? Like, let's hope not. Uh, but as far as right now it stands, yeah, I got Jonathan Martinez. And I think that the three to one line is, you know, pretty fair. Yeah, in fairness, the uh, the road to bankruptcy was really pathed by uh, betting on British grapplers. That rarely ever works out. Let's be completely honest. All right, move on to the next one. We got Manel Cap taking on Mateus Nicolau. Cap, minus 155. Nicolau can be had four plus 135. Nicolau obviously coming back. When they were going to cut the flyweight division and then they didn't cut the flyweight division. Um, What's his girlfriend's name again? She was on the Contender Series recently. I think that's probably why Nicolau got the call back. But, like, this was always a younger, you know, prospect in the division that you're like, this guy has some skills. 
surprised that he got let go. He, you know, he was off of like one loss or whatever. Uh, gets gets cut because they're getting rid of the division. Good to have him back in the full tier cap. Uh, it was really unimpressive, in my opinion, in his first fight. I don't. I have no interest. If the guy's going to show up and throw that few strikes, just kind of hang out and uh, hang out on the outside. In some of his fights, ugh, I'm not betting him uh, as a favorite against anybody in this division until I see something more clear. What's your take here? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think you got a live underdog, and not by virtue of like we absolutely love him and he's got the skills and how he matches up. Is that Manel Cap is fresh, he's primed for the taking from any underdog who's just willing to go out there and throw a little more volume. Like it was such a letdown performance from him in his UFC debut. And mind you, I mean, the, he's coming in here against Alexander Pantoja. It's not an easy fight. The guy's got skills everywhere. But, you know, he could have won that fight. And that's what makes this one tough, right? On one hand, Cap clearly does have the skills to hang with the upper echelon and beat the upper echelon. On the other hand, it's like he just fought the world's worst game plan. Coming into this spot, it's like, what does he do? He took no damage last time out. So obviously he's fresh. It's a quick turnaround. If he comes in with the same game plan, yeah, I'm definitely fading his ass. I think Matisse Nicolau is going to have the volume and he's going to be able to just, you know, outwork him for a close but unanimous or split decision. Uh, but on the other hand, it's like Cap keeps his fight standing. Yeah, he is the more polished striker. He's the more rangy guy. He does have the big power. And with Matisse Nicolau, he, he was, you know, the UFC kind of did him dirty, right? He comes off the ultimate fighter. He lost to Danilo Lopez, who lost in the finals, but he also had a win over Reginaldo Vieira, who won the whole thing. So he gave a good of account of himself on the ultimate fighter. And he's super young, like you mentioned, 23 years old. Comes to the UFC, beats Bruno Rodriguez, beats John Moraga, who's a former title contender, right? Beats Luis Smolka, which was a, a very solid victory for him. And then loses to Dustin Ortiz. No shame in that. Getting knocked out by Dustin Ortiz is a little strange, but losing Dustin Ortiz. And, and they cut him. They cut a bunch of flyweights, Dustin Ortiz included. It's like, man, they didn't even abolish the flyweight division. Why, just, uh, why was there a mass exodus of like decent good level flyweights, this kid being one of them. But since then, he hasn't really done a ton. He fought twice uh, on the regional scene, once against Alan Gabriel on Future FC and then Felipe Efrain in Brave CF. But he hasn't fought in, you know, nearly two years now. He is only 28 years old. He's a Nova Union guy. You'd, one would presume he's going to be in good shape and he's going to be aggressive. And, and that's a huge thing here is that if you don't know a whole lot, we've got some question marks. How's he going to come in after a two-year long absence? And how's he been? is that these Nova Union guys are known for their aggression. That's the thing about them, is that they'll pretty much go forward on you. And we're, what we're looking for here is that this kid's willing to go forward and, and, and pressure Manel Cap. And if he does, then uh, as far as like his underdog status, yeah, he would be a live underdog. The other thing, though, is that we go back to that. He did get knocked out by Justin Ortiz. He got head kicked. He got KO'd. He doesn't have anything in the way of a super notable win since then. He's, hell, he's only fought twice since then, and that was three years ago. So... Is he is he prime for a knockout loss to a guy like Manel Cap who has a ton of power and could you know chin check him at some point? It's possible. Could the same be a low level striking affair that neither guy is really willing to throw their hands and it's a reluctant pace? Yeah, yeah, it could happen as well. Do I feel super strong on either side? No, no. But um, I had Pantoja over over Cap last time. We were on the same page. We had Alexander Pantoja, and Cap did nothing to scream like, "Man, this guy, this guy's legit." This guy, he just didn't let his hands go. It was super frustrating to watch. Will he come out in a sophomore outing, score a first-round knockout, and be everybody's darling come Sunday morning? Again, potentially, could be. But I hate, I hate banking on these, like, shoulda, shoulda, coulda. You know, this guy could do this. This guy should do this. Olberg. Oh, fuck, he's a good striker, right? He's supposed to be a good striker. He should do this. He should, he should pace himself to a kickboxing pace because he's a kickboxer. No, no, no. Shoulda, coulda, woulda, right? Uh, it, that's the fight game in a nutshell. So can Matisse Nicolau go out there and outwork him? Yeah. Can Manal Cap land the more meaningful shot? And land? Yeah, yeah. Is it live both sides? Yeah. But again, we're looking for some underdogs, and I think that Matisse Nicolau fits the description as an underdog with a chance. So I think um, for now, anyways, uh, I'm going to go with that underdog shot. And it looks like actually the 135 is gone, and the lowest I see is plus 125. Not that that really changes very much. And what I want, last thing I want to say is Matisse Nicolau, he's already winning. Uh, Luana Pinheiro, who's on the uh, Contender Series, that's her name. And they're, they're training out of ATT now. Like, it's not really Nova. Uh, Nova and Yao doesn't really exist anymore, does it? Well, I tried to find stuff on him because I remember him being in ATT back in the day. You know, he was doing mm -hmm. camps at American Top Team. And then when I tried to look at anything on the social media, it didn't appear that he was... He, he ended up in Vegas, right? Like, he's come to the Performance Institute a few weeks out. But it didn't... There was nothing at him in the room, Right. There was stuff of him at like Team Renegade, or not Team Renegade, sorry, 
it was like at, at various affiliation gyms. So listen, if he's at American Top Team, that's probably where he's at. Even better. He's young. He's at a great gym. He's got a little bit of more volume, a little more pressure. Could he win this fight? Yeah. But do, do either of us feel super confident? But no. But listen, Dogger Pass, that's the name of the show. And that's what this fight comes down to. It's a Dogger Pass situation. So I'll take Nicolau. Yeah, I imagine they're yeah the they're probably at the Performance Institute because his girlfriend looked great on Contender Series. She looks very very marketable, and uh, that that would really make sense that they're going to give her the biggest push they possibly can because she looks like a prospect with a lot of hope. All right, we move yeah. on down the card. We've got Darren Stewart taking on Eric Anders. The dentist is minus one seventy five. Eric Anders can be had for plus one fifty. We got. Ah, I mean, listen, I do love me some Eric Anders, but he's been a bust, uh, and he's been a bust for, you know, a, a fair amount of time now. Uh, he's another one of these guys that just has a ton of skill. There's a ho- ton of upside to him. He just struggles in really putting it all together. I mean, the narrative of him right since the get-go, right from even when he was fighting with LFA, is like, here's a guy, he's a former college football national champion with the University of Alabama. He's one of the captains on the team. You know, he creates his big play to help win them the national title. He's like a hero amongst college football players a lot of his teammates go to the nfl he himself apparently has tryouts with the nfl but decides i want to be an mma fighter instead it's like oh baby we got a guy he's young he's a freak athlete he's going to come over here he's going to do great things the ufc did a pretty good job of pushing him initially in that he comes off his lfa championship win he had beaten brandon allen in lfa he had a couple decent wins he knocks out rafael natal in the first round of his debut that's a solid little victory marcus perez fight it wasn't the sexiest thing going, but Marcus Perez is a tricky opponent. I think we have all established that at this point. So still a nice little win for Eric Anders. And then he's headlining a fight in Brazil, a five-round main event against Leota Machida in Brazil. He's three fights into his UFC career. Like, Eric Anders' trajectory is looking good. And I bet Eric Anders in that spot. You, for some reason, think he won. But I know, split decision in Brazil or not, which screams robbery. Eric Anders lost that fight, and I was not upset with getting the losing the split because rewatching it then and rewatching it now, he just allows the moment to pass him by. And this is a reoccurring theme in pretty much all the fights since then. He does have skill. He does have big power. He is a large and physically imposing guy. But too often, he just stares down the barrel of the gun without trying to beat the guy to the punch, and he pays the ultimate price for it. Right? The Tim Williams fight, he's probably, I wouldn't say losing, but it's close. It's a pretty competitive fight against Tim Williams. He might be losing against Tim Williams. And then one of the most boneheaded decisions you'll ever see in your life, Williams gets himself KO'd in the third. Okay. Tiago Santos fight, no man should go through a beating like that. He's dropped multiple times. He's beat up. He did score multiple takedowns over Tiago Santos, which apparently isn't all that impressive, but he just took a, a lot of damage. The Elias Theodoru fight, which is in Toronto, we were both there present. He, he hurt Elias at one point. And doesn't follow it up. Just walk, just walks straight line. Walks at him. Doesn't let his hands go. Elias dances to the outside. Elias just picks away at him. Elias wins a split decision. This is a bad run, man. I think it's Khalil Roundtree. Okay, maybe he'll take Khalil Roundtree down. No, no. He takes a life-changing beating. He got dropped three times in that fight. It's just like a crazy amount of damage. So now no one's on him, but the UFC's built him back. You know, Vinicius Moreira. That's a free win for him to get him back going. A little confidence thing. The Gerald Mearshart fight. He looked awful. And he won a split decision. And then his last time against Christoph Jocko, I thought he looked a little bit better in that fight. But he loses the decision. It's, it's the same thing. It's just like he can never really get over that hump. Whereas like Darren Stewart is the complete opposite. He wasn't like Eric Anders. No one had any expectations for this guy when he came to the UFC, right? Anders, supposed to be a good prospect. Darren Stewart, not so much. It's that like he's consistently showing you the improvements. He's consistently showing you he's working on his ground plan. And his striking's pretty, you know, decent enough. And how does this fight match up? Well, Eric Anders probably does have that wrestling advantage, but he's not going to go out there and pursue a, a wrestling-heavy game plan. More so than not, he might try to mix in a few takedowns here and there, but he'll probably stand relatively flat-footed in the middle of the octagon. Darius Stewart will just beat him to the punch and just kind of outpoint him. Now, I'll give one thing for Eric Anders. He went to the decision with Khalil Roundtree, and he was it was a third-round corner stoppage against Tiago Santos. It was booked for five. Yeah, figure me that. All the same, it's like this guy has shown he can take a beating in a 15-minute span and keep ticking, right? So I don't think Darren Stewart goes out there and knocks him out. I don't think Darren Stewart cements him. Likewise, you know, Anders has got fight-ending power, but he never really lets his hands go. And his power hasn't been materializing, right? He knocked out Vinicius Moreira. 
that's like the only knockout since that stretch dating back to the Rafael Natal and Tim Williams fights. So this fight's going the distance, I think. I think that you chase the over. I think that you chase the fight goes the distance. And I think what other side that you're going to end up going with, you take it by decision. I'm going to go with Darren Stewart. I'm going to try to improve his favorite status by going Darren Stewart by decision. But uh, again, yeah, we got two relatively middling guys. Both guys do have a path of victory, but I think Darren Stewart more often times than not ends up uh, getting it done. Are we sure that uh, Darren Stewart has the, or sorry, that uh, Eric Anders has the wrestling advantage in this spot? Well, I mean, just, yeah, like he's, he's strong, he's physical. If he gets you down, I mean, he's got okay top control, let's say, but yeah. no, no, yeah, we're not sure because he just doesn't I do mean, it enough, nor has he really done it consistently. Darren Stewart took down, you know, Kevin Holland three times. He's taken down a bunch of guys. The problem with Darren Stewart, and uh, if this ends up being really close on the feet, uh, maybe your decision probably makes sense, but I mean, Darren Stewart's only the most he's ever thrown in a UFC fight is 57 significant strikes. Like, shit, that's real dicey. If it's anywhere competitive, I mean, either one of these guys get to around 60. At minus 175, it's I, I just don't feel good about uh, lay, uh, this, laying this him by decision. Is- Right, that's fair. This is what I'll counter with on the Darren Stewart side of things. It's like Darren Stewart has fought effectively. Bavon Lewis does not want to strike. He's going to just clinch onto you and hold you up against the cage, nullifying any type of action. Deron Wynn, come on! Deron Wynn is just looking to clinch onto you, null- slow things down, nullify any type of action. Then he draws Bartos Fabinski. Like, like, my God! Are we trying to ruin this guy's career? Like, even if he beats these guys, which he beat Bavon Lewis and Duran Wynn, it's really hard to look good against these guys because of this grinding-type style. The Mac Batola fight's exciting. The Kevin Holland fight, he lost a split decision to Kevin Holland. Mm-hmm. And Kevin Holland's in right now. Kevin Holland's killing guys right now. Kevin, guy, guys are lucky to make it out of a round with Kevin Holland. And yet, he's in a competitive split decision with the guy. Lost. Mm-hmm. No, I thought he lost, but in a competitive split decision with the guy. That, to me, screams like, yeah, man, he... The low volume aside, it's like he's he's fought in different styles. Eric Anders has fought a pile of punching bags. You're supposed to – no, I, I shouldn't say a pile of punching bags. The Vinicius Moreras of the world, you know, like that you're supposed to look good. He did look good. The Gerald Mearshart, you know, he, Gerald Mearshart's got a questionable chin at times. Maybe Anders is going to go expose him. Like, no, tooth and nail split decision victory. And his last time out, same thing. It's like he just goes through the motions too much. So that's why I think that it'll just be a slow – It'll the, at some point the action will just stall a little bit. And this thing goes the over. But um, yeah, I mean, they're both middleweights that have finishes on their records. They could pull it off. I just think that this one's going to end up being more closer to a sparring session. Yeah, I was just my my big gripe with what you were saying is I've, I'm not sure. Darren Stewart may actually be the better wrestler than Eric Anders. Eric Anders never really uses that wrestling. We see Darren Stewart try to use it all the time. But as we have said, uh, when we were talking about Davy Grant earlier, the path to vet, uh, bankruptcy Lies in betting on British grapplers. Never a good time. All right, next one up, we've got Angela Hill taking on uh, Ashley Yotter. Obviously, this fight was supposed to take place a couple weeks back. Yotter's corner, test positive for COVID. They rebook it to this card. Not much has really changed. Angela Hill just became a bigger favorite, I think. I mean, does she win 80% of the time? Maybe. But I think the line is more or less right here. I think Angela Hill just beat or wins on volume for the most part. But if I was forced to bet on this fight, I think I would just, I would actually probably bet Yotter to win by decision, which I don't have the number in front of me, but like plus 330. I think it's dog or pass if you were going to, if you were forced to make a play on this one, just hope that Yotter is able to get some takedowns. Like I don't feel good about laying minus 400. Like, I think Hill wins 80% of the time. I think the line is more or less correct. So, uh, pass for me. What about you? Yeah, I mean, we've already had this fight booked, and a lot of people were screaming that Ashley Yotter is a live underdog. You know, sure. The value side of the bet, yeah, sure, because it's a huge line for Angela Hill. Both women fought previously, and it was it was a competitive fight back then. I mean, Ashley Yotter successfully took her down three times. You know, it was it was a decision fight. It was was close. was competitive. But it's like, what have both of them done since then? And you've got Angela Hills fought 11 times since then in the UFC versus six fights in the UFC for Ashley Yotter. Okay, no problem. We know that Angela Hill likes to stay active and fight twice as much. But it's the improvements that Angela Hills made and the level of competition that Angela Hill's been facing. So when you look at Angela Hill, like her last fight, Michelle Watterson, okay? Former title contender. It's a five-round fight. 
It's a split decision win for Watterson. So you're, you're in it at the highest level. The Claudia Gadelia fight, former multiple time title mm-hmm. challenger, uh, one of the best girls in the division. It's a close fight. It's a competitive fight, split decision, but that's high level. The other fights on her record that she shows, she fought uh, Jan. She fought Ronda Marcos, not the highest of level. She fought Nina Ansarov. She fought Jessica Andrade. It's like, so she's fought in a lot of these high level fighters and she gives a great account of herself usually out there. Ashley Yotter, meanwhile, in her time since she's fought Angela Hill, she's fought Amanda Bobby Cooper, no longer with the promotion. Suri Kondo, no longer with the promotion. She lost to Randa Marcos, who's on a terrible run right now with the promotion. She lost to Livion Souza, who surely they're going to release from the promotion. I mean, this girl's run in the UFC has just been absolutely disastrous. And then she has a win over Miranda Granger, who surely is going to be released from the promotion within the next 12 months. So so why, why are we banking on you? We have this perceived takedown uh, advantage. Because Angela Hill got submitted in the first round by Randa Marcos like a year ago. That wasn't a year ago, sorry, Paul. You're sorry, sens- I'm looking at right here. Your I'm sense sad. of time. Uh, no, two years. It's gone. Two years ago, pretty much to the day. We got March 23rd, 2019. Ronda Marcos, armbar, round one. Like, if you're laying minus 400... Like I know they they both have losses and like and Yotter got outstruck by by Ronda Marcos like horrible scene there. Don't get me wrong, I think Angela Hill wins more often than not, of course. But Jesus, man, I didn't. Do I think Angela Hill's probably made improvements on the grappling since then? Yes. Do I think that this type of situation is still ripe for armbar from guard? You bet your ass, I do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Armbar from guard strikes again. Uh, I mean, sure. However, when you say that, you got Ashley Yotter, supposed to be the jiu-jitsu fighter. She's had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight fights in the UFC. All fa- eight fights have gone the distance. Yeah, so she ain't submitting shit. Even if she doesn't get the fight to the ground, she ain't submitting shit. She doesn't go for submissions. She mostly just, you know, holds the position down. She did try to submit Miranda Granger a few times. Couldn't submit her. No, Not exactly a great showing. My, my big thing here with Angela Hill, I get 36 years old. I get at some point she's going to slow down. I get at some this and that. Um, last fight against Michelle Watterson, okay? Michelle Watterson went one of 18 on takedown. Now, Michelle Watterson knows how to wrestle. Michelle Watterson has a decent judo. Michelle Watterson. The Claudia Gadelia fight, the Claudia Gadelia fight is more showing, though, that Claudia Gadelia goes one for four on takedown attempt. Gets her down in the first round. After that, it's like she tires her out. The take down, she's worked on that takedown defense. She's not giving up multiple takedowns in these fights. She gives up a couple takedowns. She actually shows a 77% takedown uh, defense in the UFC. And that's, that's uh, you know, if you go by recency, it's even way better. It's like at some point, yeah, yeah, takedown defense was a problem. I just think that she's really worked on that. And when the fight does stay standing, she's got the volume for days. She goes out there and she'll easily throw over 100 significant strikes and land. When she does get taken down, you'll notice this a lot, she'll scramble and just pop right back up. So even if Yotter goes out, Yotter's only ever taken an opponent down more than twice, once, in all eight of those UFC fights. And it, and it was Angela Hill, okay? But that's mm-hmm. the only time she's, she's completed more than two takedowns in a fight. She's not a chain wrestler. She's not someone that's just going to take you down and smother you over and over. She's just like a mid-range type fighter. She's fought in lower mid-range type fighters. She's definitely a 4-1 to one underdog. But does that, does that say that she can't win? No, no. She, she's a live underdog. She's the value side. But like, I'm not picking her. I just don't like the lot, right? So yeah. I got Angela Hill. I think, like you said, she wins 8 out of 10 times. But they're only going to f- run this thing back one more and anything can happen. But I think Angela Hill, more polished, keep the fight standing, out, out volume for sure. And the biggest thing is keep your back get off against the cage. Smaller, smaller cage doesn't matter, right? They're 115-pound women. Like, it's not going to... Big cage, small cage doesn't matter in this fight. But Ashley Yotter doesn't need a takedown. She she doesn't mind just holding you up against the cage and trying to grind it down a little bit. So Hill's just got to be on her bicycle, move laterally, and use the jab. She yeah. should win this fight. And if she gets and taken. by decision, whoever whoever's taking it, I think we're taking it by decision. I mean, of course you are. That's the only way that Angela Hill would even really be playable in this situation. But yeah, like obviously Angela Hill training with uh, uh, Carla Esparza in San Diego. Like, that's probably where a lot of these improvements have been. And when they're on the feet, of course, she's going to be throwing at least twice as many significant strikes per minute as uh, as Yotter. I just can't get around that minus 400. All right, we got Charles Jordan taking on Marcelo Arroyo. Um, 
Uh, Jordan, minus 255 favorite. Royo can be had for plus 215. Who you got? Okay, so I'm going to take Charles Jordan, but I mean, buyer beware here. I, I'm not... I'm not really fully sold on him. Uh, 25 years old. He's the, he's the lone Canadian. Three Canadians on this card. He's the lone one that I am going to back. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I just think there's a lot that he still needs to learn. I mean, he's only 25 years old, but he's wild and reckless. I mean, he's fighting on the TKO regional scene up here in, in Canada, Quebec more specifically. Yeah, like he was super exciting, super wild, super green. But he goes out there and he gets these wins. He's a dual champion for the organization. They just feed him whoever they can. There's not a whole lot of talent available for him. But he just makes an immediate jump right to the UFC. There, there wasn't any, you know, here's some – he fought TJ Laramie. I guess that would have been his notable opponent. But he didn't fight these, like, savvy UFC veterans that had been cut, you know, big-name guys that were on the tail end of their career, guys that were experienced, guys that were going to give him some rounds. Like, he, you know, he beat Taylor Lapalus's brother Damien. Maybe, maybe that's a fight that went a, a little bit later that got him some rounds. But I just thought he was super green and not – quite UFC ready, but he's going to get there, but he's really young. He's 23 years old. And then it's something that you don't do with prospects very often. They signed him, moved him up a weight class and sent him to Rochester to fight Des Green, whose style is cancer to Jordan's style. Like, you know, that grinding wrestling affair is not what this kid likes to do in open space. We've seen him get grinded before. Like this is a bad matchup for him. He's up a weight class and he, and he's going to Rochester, which is, which is where Jess Green's from. Like, bad news. And he loses. He loses a decision. He gets taken out multiple times. Doesn't, doesn't look part- particularly good. Then he gets the Duho Cho fight. Loses the first round. Not looking part- particularly good. He's in it. He knocks out Duho Cho. God damn. Then you give him the Andre Feely fight, you know? He looked good. He lost a split. You know what? It was a competitive enough fight. Wrestling was his downfall, as is always his downfall. But, you know, it was a competitive fight against a guy that's, a, you know, a classy veteran of the sport. And then that Joshua Calabau fight, that changes everything. Because it just shows you, again, this kid's super green, man. He got rocked hard in the first round against Calabau. He's losing that fight against Josh Calabau. Ends mm-hmm. up winning two and three. Close. You know, he won one third, third round for sure. Second round was close. And he ends up getting a, the, the split decision, like the split draw. The draw yeah. fight. And yeah, that, that to was, me, just screamed like... Terrifying. Yeah, you know, so terrifying because I was so happy I got the push. I was so happy. I was just like, you know what? I, I'll take it because I didn't, lo- I didn't win any money. I did not lose any money. I will take it. But this kid was supposed to go out there and absolutely stop. He was the lock of the week. Everybody, well, not everybody. I saw some people that were going against him. He's a minus 475 uh, favorite in this spot against Colobao. It's like, it's just, it's written Charles Rodin is going to go out and have a spectacular performance, and he's going to be able to use his striking. Well, you saw in the Colobow fight, it's like, it wasn't his striking, man. His, his striking super wild. And he, again, he's only 25, but he just, there's these openings. He loves throwing spinning back fists. He likes spinning. He likes to keep his hands low at times. He likes to peacock at times. Uh, he is hittable, and you can't hurt him. And then as far as his takedown defense goes, it's non existent. So there's massive glaring holes in this guy's game all over. You can beat him standing. You can beat him on the ground. There's ways to defeat him. He squeaked out a draw, and we were happy to get a draw. And he's a 5-1 to one favorite over Koulibao. Um, that, that just screamed like, okay, we've got a couple issues in this guy. So now they book him to fight Steve Garcia. Okay, I like the fight. Sure, my, makes sense. And Steve Garcia pulls out, and you got Marcelo Rojo. Marcelo Rojo got signed to take on Rowney Barcellos. So... So he's fucked, right? He's got no path to victory over Rowney Barcellos. Barcellos pulls out of the fight. Coincidentally, Charles Jordan's opponent, Steve Garcia, pulls out of the fight, and they've just matched up this one together. And as far as how he matches up against Charles Jordan, similar to how Josh Coulibau did. You know, he's a little bit undersized, but he's aggressive. He's got good striking. He's going to come forward, and he's going to let his hands go. He's got good power. Jordan's hittable. If he hits him, he can hurt him. If he can hurt him, he can turn the tide. He can make this happen for himself. But ultimately, why I didn't pull the trigger on him is um, he is a 35er. He's fought his entire career at 135 pounds. He did fight his last fight against Victor Hugo Mandrigal at a catch weight of like 139. He was going to fight round each Barcellos at 135. Uh, now he's jumping up to 145 to take on Charles Jordan. And Jordan, again, fought in TKO and made his D- UFC debut against Des Green at 155 pounds. So does it matter? Does size matter? Not always. Not always. But I think Charles Rene is going to be the bigger body. He's going to have a little bit better output. And I think that being that bigger guy taking on the smaller um, 
uh, Marcelo Rojo is that even if Rojo hurts him, I don't think he knocks him out. And what we've seen in the cool about fight is like you, you're going to hopefully knock this guy out because if you don't, he'll battle his way back in. Mm-hmm. These 25 year old kids, you know, you've seen it this weekend in Song Yudong. They kept talking about it, like he had a shin straight to the head and it was like, not, it was like a jab, you know? But he's 23 years old. You can do that at 23. Uh, Charles Rodin can get away with that stuff young. He's young. He'll get hurt. He's in good shape. His body will allow him to regenerate and come back into it. But down the stretch, down, down the long term, looking at big picture for this guy, I don't know. You know, what do you work on? Do you work on your on, on tightening up your striking defense and you know build build a, a career for yourself as a dynamic striker and leave those glaring takedown defense issues? Or do you work on your grappling exclusively and all of a sudden you can't strike with Josh Kulabal anymore? Like, where's the balance? What does he work on? So he's got issues moving forward. I don't know that Marcello Rojo is going to be the guy that that exposes him right here, right now. And then uh, the, the last thing here is that Marcelo Rojo, he's got – how many fights has he got? I don't think he's ever been to decision. He's got uh, like 20, 24 fights, 22 fights. He's got 22 pro fights, and he, he's, not, he's not going to decision. With Charles Jordan, it's like, yeah, yeah, he's a dynamic guy, but Rojo just puts the pressure on him. This thing's probably ending inside the distance. If I'm taking, if I'm taking Charles Jordan to last and survive, then it's probably going to be him getting the finish later in this one, but – Again, Rojo is a dangerous opponent. I just I, I can't quite pull the trigger on him. A little bit undersized, and I gotta at least have one Canadian on this card. Imagine I went picked against all the Canadians. Like what a <laughs> terrible person I'd be. You can make an argument for picking against all three Canadians, but you can also make an argument for all three might win. I just don't see it. So I'm gonna go with Jordan as my lone draw. And uh, yeah, just please, hopefully that cool about fight was just a you know a bad night. Fading Canada is, is a winning proposition in 2021, man. We fucking it's suck. profitable, yeah. All right, we got been profitable for the last three years, I guess three yeah. three to five anyway. All right, we got uh, Ronnie Yaya taking on Ray Rodriguez. Ronnie Yaya, a minus 300 favorite. Rodriguez can be had four plus 250. Over under in this one is one and a half rounds. Minus 155 to the over. Plus 125 to the under. I'm just going to level with you. We got Ronnie Yaya. He's got one real path. The wrestling isn't even great. He loves pulling guard. Um, I think this this fight is Ronnie Yaya by submission. I see it like plus 105. I was thinking about taking it yesterday. It was plus 110. I think it's going to go off probably closer to like minus 125, minus 130. The wrestling isn't great. He pulls guard. It can be very, very frustrating. All of that stuff. But... We got Ray Rodriguez has been submitted by I mean Kelleher's got a great guillotine that happens to people, um, and he got submitted on LFA by Chris Gutierrez like Ronnie Aya if Ro- yeah, Ronnie Aya gets this to the ground he's he's very very crafty he'll find that sub I wouldn't really want to put the minus three hundred on any sort of tickets because I know this guy it's just like if things don't go his way. He'll, like, flop to his back. Like, he'll try to be sneaky because he doesn't really have, like, the greatest wrestling to put the fight where he wants it to be. I know that uh, Rodriguez has a knockout win over Jim uh, Jimmy the Brick Flick as well. So, obviously, that is the danger uh, in this fight. So, minus 300, eh, no bueno. Uh, Ronnie Yaya is either going to lose a decision, get knocked out, or win by submission, in my opinion. So, my uh, plus 105, Yaya by submission is my play here what do you think yeah there might not be a fighter on the roster that has uh, screwed me over more times than ronnie yaya and i don't mean that to discredit him i mean he wins what i do not think he's got a chance at winning he's so one-dimensional with what he does best but what he does best oh boy oh boy you and i have laughed about this since we started the bookie beatdown show in 2014 uh ronnie yaya is the 2003 adcc champ like Bro, the, his best days are over. But it's like, no, they're not. He's got good ring IQ in that he doesn't really do a ton well other than drag these fights to the ground. And he manages to do it. You know, He's able to do it. He's not an upper echelon guy. But as far as them giving him mid to lower mid-level guys, he always routinely shines on them. And one thing about him is his, his uh, cardio is awful. His striking has always been just absolutely abysmal. But man, his last two or three fights... Striking has looked increasingly good because he's not worried about you taking him down. In fact, he welcomes the idea of you taking him down. 
So he doesn't have to worry about that. So now he just runs forward like reckless and he lets his hands go. He doesn't have a ton of power, but you see like even in the Ricky Simon fight, like he's touching him up, like he's hitting with some decent shots. Um, the Enrique Barzola fight, like he's letting his hands go. His striking is most definitely improved. He goes with a little bit of a kicking game as well, but where he wants to get this fight is to the ground. When he's fought in this level, he shine routinely. You look at his last three wins, Henry Briones, first round submission, Russell Doan, third round submission, Luke Sanders with the first round heel hook. It's like, he can do it, and it's and it's a Kimura arm triangle and a heel hook. You look at his entire career; it's like he what, whatever he will give him, he'll take, and he makes it work for himself. Now, again, cardio is not really good, but he's not exerting himself over it. He's thirty six years old; he's not a great athlete. Doesn't matter. He just he knows how to get these fights where he wants them. Now, as far as them giving him, you know, Joe Soto is technically speaking, of course, a former UFC title challenger. You know, he's a guy who's a former Tachi Palace world champion. He's a guy that's fought at a very high level and given a good account of himself. So he loses that fight; that's no big deal. The Ricky Simone fight. Ricky Simone fought an excellent game plan. Like, don't engage this guy standing. Don't engage this guy on the ground. Get him to flop to his back. You know, kick him. Play one knee down. Fought, again, fought a good game plan and win. And then the Enrique Barzola fight, you know, again, that, that's another fight that's a draw. But Barzola's supposed to be a top 15 guy on his way up who's just freakishly strong. And he's an American top team. And he's, you know, he's got all these variables. And he's, he's improving. And Ronnie Yaya is just the old guy also from American top team. The old guy from the block who's very one-dimensional, but it's like he knows how to make it work for him. And against Ray Rodriguez, it's like they've given him just that. You mentioned the fact that Ray Rodriguez got a win over Jimmy Flick. Cool, because we all like Jimmy Flick. Um, Ray Rodriguez has got 16 pro wins, only three by knockout, but he does have eight wins by submission. And you look at a lot of his fights, it's like he prefers to grapple. Like That's how he's winning his fights. He prefers to grapple with these guys. His last fight against Brian Kelleher it didn't last very long, so who knows what he wanted to do. But he's taking a fight in the UFC on short notice, and... Gives a poor account of himself. He's now he's now fallen into cannon fodder territory. You did us a favor. You jumped up. You took a fight. You let us down. You know it's the same thing with uh, Megan Anderson. Just got released. How do you go from fighting for a world title on Saturday to be released from the promotion on a Tuesday? Like how does how does that happen, right? Well, it's well, Amanda, like ah, Amanda doesn't want to fight in the division anymore. Well, he says at the post-fight press conference that they're open to Amanda fighting at 45, and she says, you know, she'll keep fighting on. And I don't know if you have to go wrangle up a Kayla Harrison from, I guess she's she was a PFL making millies, but I, I guess she just fought with Invicta, and it was her first time making 45, so do you go that route? Do Does Cyborg at some point come back to the UFC for a one-off fight? I'd love to see that rematch. I don't know why they didn't capitalize and just do it again before they released her, but all the same, it's like, you know, are there a couple options for it? Yeah, but is there a whole division to be there? No. But what I'm saying is you do the favor, you do the UFC a favor. But bitch is coming out of a win over Norma Dumont and Zara Fairn, and she's jumping into a fight with Amanda Nunez to be released. It's like, man, where, where was my favor? Uh, it's like you looked so bad. No, nobody enjoyed that fight, right? Nobody nobody says, oh, man, I'd love to rewatch that on the broadcast tomorrow. It's just like it was like a hot knife through butter, right? Ray Rodriguez did them a favor by taking that fight on short notice, but the way it ended, you know, 39 seconds into the first round, he, he submitted with the guillotine choke. Like, it's not it's not a spirited thing. Meanwhile, you got Ronnie Yaya as one of the most tenured guys in the UFC roster. I mean, he made his debut. He's a former WEC guy, obviously. His contract just got absorbed, but he made his UFC debut 10 years ago against Matt Brown and fucking beat Matt Brown, who's now a legendary ATT coach. It's like the guy's been in there with some of these the best guys in the world. And he's got all that back class. And I, and I do think that the UFC is probably giving him a favor in that, hey, man, thanks for fighting Ricky Simone, a top 15, top 10 guy. Thanks for fighting Barzola, another young up-and-comer on his way up. Thanks for taking these tough fights when we've asked you. It hasn't been going your way. So we'll give you another one of these lower-level guys who should figure out to be more of a grappling match that you have a live chance in there. With. So I think you go with Ronnie Yaya. You mentioned it your best yourself. It's like, are we confident, Ronnie? No, I never bet Ronnie Yaya. Now that I am betting Ronnie Yaya, I'm certainly not betting him confidently. Um, but the submission prop is plus money, right? So, like, if you were going to bet Ronnie Yaya, you are going to take him by submission. You're going to chase a little bit of plus money there. But in terms of like the grand scheme of things, like, is this uh, is this a top line parlay piece? No. But minus two eighty suggests should be one of your more confident plays. But I've seen this routine with Ronnie Yaya. Like, you know, he'll get tired. And once he gets tired, he's the worst guy in the roster. You know, once he's got a little gas in the tank, he's extremely skillful in dragging the fight to the ground and grappling you. But if Ray Rodriguez just happened to survive, he could make a fight out of it. So for that reason, I am going to play Yaya. I'm going to play that Yaya by submission, but just like not all in on it. Yeah, you'll be screaming at your team. If he doesn't get the fight to the ground pretty, pretty like some point in round two, 
if he hasn't got a takedown at that point, you'll be screaming. At you your live TV. bet. You live bet Rodriguez. If this if this yeah. fight is close in round two and and Rodriguez is not submitted yet, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking Ronnie Yaya doesn't win third rounds. It's not something he does. And at 36, I don't know that he suddenly shores that part of his game up. No, he'll be lying on his back, going like, "Come on down here, please, please," because I have no energy or no will to do anything else. It, it's dicey. That's why I think like it's taking that. That submission prop or or straight up pass minus three hundred on Ronnie Yaya, who's a guard puller, not the greatest wrestler, um, and you know he's what thirty five, thirty six years old. Uh, risky biz, in my opinion. All right, next up we've got uh, late addition to the card. Nazrat Hakbaraz takes on uh, Hafa Garcia minus two sixty five. Hak uh, Hakbaraz to plus two hundred. Garcia, I don't know a full Garcia, and I can damn as hell tell you. I don't know a half of Garcia either. I uh, haven't had time to look into this guy uh, yet. I see he's coming off of a win over Humberto Band and I took on Estevan Payan over in uh, Combate Americas, but uh, I'm not too deep into it. So uh, you got you got any takes here? Well, again, I mean, it's short notes for everybody. It's hard to get a read on what the line is going to be because they just released it. So as we record the show, I mean, it could be drastically different by the time the show's even released. Early right? action. But it's just... Early action yeah. came in on uh, on the underdog. They opened it up at like minus three fifty, and then people took some shots on on Garcia. But I don't know. Yeah, and it's weird. It's weird how the fight came together. So originally, this is this is how this fight, Nazareth Hackross versus Hafa Garcia, came together. It originally started as Guram Kudelitz versus Don Madge, and then Kudelitz pulls out of the fight. So now Nazareth Hackross replaces him, and he's going to fight Don Madge. And then Don Madge can't get a visa, so he goes after Garcia. So you start off with two completely different guys, and what you end up with is Nazareth Hackross versus Half Garcia. So technically speaking, you know, a lot of people are talking about Garcia's taking this fight on really short notice, but I mean Nazareth was taking this fight on short notice. The thing is, if you go on social media, he's the one that was campaigning for the fight. He was the one that wanted to fight. He's the one that wants to get in there. When Nazareth, I really like this guy. I mean, we talk about another guy who's only 25 years old, but he's testing himself. He's in there against tough level of competition. And uh you know, and getting better, getting he's he's a legitimate prospect. Win over Marty Casey, that's a solid win. Win over Joaquin Silva, knocked him on the second round, and the volume that that he's showing in that fight looked awesome. Gets caught by Drew Dober, shit. Dober gonna do that to some guys, and then his last fight against Alex Munoz, he didn't look great, but I think people probably don't give Alex Munoz as much respect as he deserves. Like that guy actually pretty decent himself. So again, with Nazareth Young. But he's, he's putting skills together all over. I mean, I like his striking. I, I, I think that his striking defense needs a little bit of work, but he's got great volume. He's a long-rangey guy. He likes to fight it from the southpaw stance. Good left hand, good kick game. Uh, his ground game's pretty solid. Wrestling's pretty good. Submission defense, pretty good. Cardio's pretty good. Chin, you want to say that he doesn't have any chin issues. You have seen him hurt before. You have seen him stung before. He did get knocked down that Drew Dober fight only, what, a minute into the first round. But I think that, again, he's only 25 years old. I don't think he has durability issues. I just think it was a bad fight. It is what it is. Him versus Don Madge would have been a lot of fun because you've got Don Madge, who's uh, you know a Muay Thai fighter from from South Africa, likes to mix in his wrestling a little bit, but it's mostly just a, that Muay Thai striker. And you got Nazareth Hackbarost, you know the German striker. This is probably going to be a fun striker versus striker battle. I would have favored uh, Hackbarost, but Don Madge is still alive. Then you get Hafa Garcia. It's like it just it changes up completely. So with Hafa Garcia, I mean he's twelve and zero, but this is a guy that you know again only twenty six. He's only been fighting pro for about five years, you know. Almost all of his fights have been for Combate Americas. He does show a couple decent wins. He beat Chase Gibson, who uh, was on the Contender Series. He beat LaRue Burley, Bellator veteran. He beat Estevan Payan, yo boy, I'm just kidding. But you know, I'm UFC veteran, bare knuckle boxing UFC veteran. But I mean, he, he and he fought uh, Herberto Bandanai his last time, a five round unanimous decision. And Bandanai also fought in the UFC. So it's not like he's not fighting the best south american prospects out there the best south american fighters is that he's pretty much only exclusively been fighting south american fighters. now he's making a jump up to the ufc where he's got to take on like an internationally ranked guy in hackbaros who's been in there with tough guys he's been in there with has legitimate wins how does this fight shake shake out rafa is uh you know he's a dangerous guy he likes to he likes to grapple and i think that's his best path is maybe he goes out there gets hackbaros takes him down is able to submit or at least control some position. But if Alex Munoz wasn't able to consistently stick to that, I don't think Hafa Garcia is. As far as the state stays standing, if it, if it, the fight stays standing, then uh, Hack Cross is going to be the longer-ranger guy, better output, better fighting, better you know striking from the outside in specific. 
He's just going to chew away at him. So I got hacked Ross. You open the line at 350. A lot of people will probably just, it's an auto fade. You know what? I'm getting a big plus money plus price tag. Maybe go with Garcia. But as far as from what I see, I'm a hack Ross guy. I like hack Ross. I think he's going to grow in this division. And again, he will be a top 15, top 10 guy and fight the best guys in the division and good, good, give a good account of himself. With Garcia, it's like he still needs to have some proving. You know, he needs to go out there and fight you know, three, four, five times in the UFC before they move him along to a top 20 type fight. And that's kind of what he's getting right off the hop. So is he live? It's MMA, guys. They're always live. Everyone's always got to fight his chance. That's why we watch this sport. You know, no one can ever be counted out. But more times than not, I think that Hack Paras has got the better skill set that should prevail for him. All right. We got uh, JJ Aldrich, your baby, taking on Courtney Casey, minus 155 Aldrich, plus 135 Casey. I'll be real quick with this. J, J.J. Aldrich got outstruck like 120, or I think it's 118 to 58 against Sabina Mazo, who looked pretty horrible against Alexis Davis, you know, way long in the tooth Alexis Davis. Obviously, it was because the fight took place on the ground and all of that, but I think Courtney Casey just wins this fight on volume, and you're giving me plus money on it. I think it's going to be relatively competitive, but I just think... Courtney Casey just throws a lot more. JJ, like, it's women's, I think they're fighting at flyweight in this spot, but neither one of them really has, like, one hit or quitter type of power. I just think over the course of three rounds, just it's more of a volume fest. Courtney Casey ends up getting the dub here. Uh, I actually laid a little bit of Skrilla on Courtney Casey, plus 130. I see it's plus 120 in some spots. Plus 135 is, like, the most you can get right now. Uh, I'm in on Courtney Casey just to win a volume fest here. What's your take? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think we all we're all in agreement that things go in the distance. The odds makers got fight goes the distance at minus four hundred. JJ Aldrich's got like eight fights in the UFC, seven of which have gone the distance. She got knocked out by Macy Barber, thrown in there as the mix as well. This one probably uh, plays out as striker versus striker. Courtney Casey is, I believe, a BJJ brown belt. She may have gone promoted to black belt, but you know her husband's a BJJ black belt. She does have a decent ground game. She's just a Diaz brother, you know, like Diaz sister, I, I guess I should say. If you've got Nick Diaz, you know, we know my boy Carlos Felipe's thick Diaz. At Courtney Casey's chick Diaz. She'll stand in front of you. She'll let the hands go. Uh, she's got that attitude. And she's got the grappling to fall back on. Similar to the Diaz brothers. It's like, why not just try to grapple? It's like, yeah, I like to strike. I like to make it a scrap. I like to make it a fight. She's in your face, and that's what she does. Um, she's also, you know, pretty durable. She's got, uh, they call her cast iron. It's like, yeah, man, you got a cast iron chin on her. Like she can take a good punch. She did get submitted in the Jillian Robertson fight, but it's a bonehead decision with like 28 seconds left on the clock. And I truly do believe she just knew she was going to lose the decision. So she's like, screw it. I'll try to make something happen and try to explode up really quick. Gives her the back, gets submitted. No big deal. Again, this is someone that's durable. This thing does figure to go to the decision. So if you are going to take Casey or if you're going to take Courtney Casey or J.J. Aldrich, either side, I think you try to juice it up by taking that by decision. Um, you know, I agree with you in many ways. You know, you got Courtney Casey's 9-8 and eight, uh, pro record. Like, it's, she wins as much as she loses, but she's a fighter, and she's going to stand in your face, and she's going to throw volume. J.J. Aldrich, I think, has made the better improvements, but, you know, coming up from 115, she's not exactly the most physically, physical fighter out there, and you see her, she's really technical with her striking. She's a finesse fighter, but she doesn't like getting bullied backwards. She doesn't like someone coming forward. She doesn't like someone making it you know, a dirty fight. You even go back to the Macy Barber fight. Macy, she's actually beating Macy Barber in the first round. And then Barber just keeps pressuring her and eventually lands on her, hurts her, knocks her out. The Sabina Mazo fight, Sabina Mazo just pressures her, throws the volume, out lands her. Her other fights in the mix, the Pollyanna Vienna fight, Vienna never let her hands go. I mean, she just, she's not a striker whatsoever. The mm -hmm. Laura Mueller fight, Laura Mueller, not exactly much of a striker. The Danielle Taylor fight, Danielle Taylor's like five foot one. You know, she comes up short on all of her punches all the time. So, so yeah, you, you agree. If we were going to create a blueprint on how to defeat J.J. Aldrich in a striking battle because we knew we know she's a nice, finesse striker, it's pressure and volume, pressure and volume, pressure and volume. And that's what Courtney Casey brings to the table is pressure and volume. So it just really comes down to another dog or pass situation. Like, are either of us super confident in Courtney Casey? Well, you've laid down a bet already, so at least you've seen that it was a good plus money number and you want to jump in on it right away. Uh, but yeah, I agree. I think she's a live underdog. I just don't know that it's this is my dog play of the week or I'm super confident in like it is Courtney Casey. She's a 50-50 fighter, especially in the UFC. Maybe it, she's less than a 50-50 fighter in the UFC, really. But, um, but yeah, you know, I can see either girl winning, but I agree. She possesses the skills and what is required to go out there and 
bully J.J. Aldrich back. And if this fight does hit the ground, she has the advantage. So, like, mix in a few takedowns would be great. Can't get the takedown, pressure up against the cage. But, like, grapple a little bit and then just stay in her face and stay on her. Aldrich obviously been doing this camp with Rose Nelma Yunus, as she always does, and looks to be sharp, looks to be in good shape. But, yeah, yeah, the blueprint's there. You just got to be physical with this girl and bully her backwards, cause her to mentally doubt herself. So, for any Casey Live underdog, I don't blame me on the shot. And uh, I, will, I will side with you. I will take the underdog shot myself as well. All right, let's go. All right, we got uh, Gloria DePaula taking on Jin Yu Frey. Gloria DePaula minus 175 favorite. Uh, Jin Yu Frey can be had for plus 150. What's your take here? Yeah, this was scary to me because Jin Yu Frey should win a fight in the UFC. You know what I mean? She's got all the skills in the world that she could win a fight in the UFC. She should at some point, but she could also very well fan out here going 0 and 3. Uh, the problem that she has is the same problem that she's had throughout the course of her career is that she just doesn't throw a whole lot of volume. 1.9 I mean, striker. significant strikes landed per minute. And, and, and again, this is the it's course of her It's only in two career. fights, but... And Luke Boomy, like, she was really outmatched on the feet, so, you know, it is what it is right. there. But losing to Kay Hansen, basically, just on the fact that... Well, wait, the K Hansen one. What happened in that? She fight? got arm barred. She was she was actually she was actually doing good with the striking. I was striking K Hansen, and yeah. arguably was up two rounds going to the third, and then it was like a flying arm bar. It was like, oh man, like how did you get caught by this? But I didn't think she looked terrible in that fight. Which you have to realize, K Hansen's like twenty two years old. Like she's a she's a child. Like mm-hmm. she's developing. Jinyu Frey is like already a former Invicta champion. She's thirty five years old. She's married to Douglas Frey, you know, the former Texas regional scene veteran. They run on their own little operation down there. Like, she, this is as good of a version as you're ever going to get from her. Taking on Kay Hansen, who's like a deer in the headlights, is going to get good. I like Kay Hansen a lot. But I just mean is in the early portion of her career. So if you can't go out there and get the victory over a young Kay Hansen, you ain't, you ain't getting a victory over 25-year-old Kay Hansen. Not going to have one over a 28-year-old. Like, she's only going to get better. This was Jin Yu Frey's chance, and she just – Hold up shy. Mm-hmm. When you look at it again, I mean, that's kind of been the, the knock on her is that in her career, she has a split decision over Jody Escobel. Doesn't exactly scream anything great. Her wins, lower level. She loses to that Ayaka Hamasaki fight in Invicta, drops her title. And it's like, that's at Adam weight, 105 pounds. You know, she lost to Siohi Ham. Siohi Ham is a gangster. But if there's one thing that Siohi Ham, I like, to get knocked out in the first round by her is not a good look. No. It's at 105 pounds again. You got knocked out by an atom weight over in Korea. I get it. You're taking on the Korean champion. I get it. And then after that, it's like, you know, just middling. She went to Ryzen. She lost a rematch to Yaka Hamasaki. She comes to Invictus. She beats Ashley Cummins. It's been all over. And then she signs with the UFC. I was surprised. She's 34. She's kind of at the tail end of her career. She's And the UFC doesn't offer 105 pounds. So she takes the Kay Hansen fight up a weight class. And then when you see in the K Hansen fight, it's like, oh yeah, she's a better striker than her, but like she doesn't let her hands go. She's only ever so slightly edging out these exchanges. She's just yeah. landing the, the cleaner shots, but no volume out of her. 20... She lets the fight slip away from her. Yeah. And go ahead. Twenty six significant strikes in both of her UFC performances. Like Boomy, yeah, she was and, outgunned and... on the feet, like from the from, for, from yeah. the first bell. But against K Hansen, who you know, is, yeah, as you said earlier, like super super young, it's like you got to be throwing more than that. Like, you're not winning fights with what? She's going to end up with 30 significant strikes as a max after three rounds of work? Like, you're not going to win fights in the UFC that way. No, and, and you know, partly what I think is, this is just what I believe is the case, I'm going the last one, is that here's a girl who's worried about getting taken down because she knows that her takedown defense is an issue. It's been an issue, and she knows that she's, you know, a good technical striker. So she just waits too long for the strike, but she also doesn't want to open herself up with a combination or throw too much volume because she doesn't want to open up for that takedown. You look at her, all of her losses prior to her last time out. She's lost to Ayaka Hamasaki. You know, she's lost to Kay Hansen. Those are grapplers. But really, the two times she's taken on pure strikers, Luka Bume and Seo Hee-Han, she's getting an struck as well. So it's like, where, where does she do her best work? Clearly standing. Like, she's just not able to put it together. Now, this seems like a fight she should be able to put it together. You've got Gloria DePaula. Gloria DePaula, um, she won on Contender Series. Uh, this would be late, I mean, November 2000, or 2020, right? Mm-hmm. But, I mean, that was the first time she had fought in over a year. And her losses are to Isabel De, P- De Padua, who's a UFC veteran that did not do anything. Yeah. Ariana Carlosi, UFC veteran, didn't exactly do anything. She's lost a low level. Her wins are to low level. 
And now she's making her UFC debut almost halfway inexplicably against Jin Frey. Like, what do we like about her? But, um, yeah, Mara... there's enough to like about her. She's, she's Marabuela Silva's girlfriend. Yep. Um, and you know what? I mean, you just you look at anything online, it's like she, she looks in good shape. That all aside, you tape study your stuff, even the Contender Series fight against Paulina Macias. She's got good volume. <laughs> she's just a good striker. Like, she goes out there and she outvolumes you. Macias also was a, like a high-level judo black belt. So the fact that she was able to keep this fight in her comfort zone and, you know, outstrike her, that's perfect. Jin Frey is not going to attempt to get this fight to the ground, I don't believe. So what you have is striker versus striker. Jin Frey is a better striker, but she's not going to throw the same amount of volume. And so De- De- Paula probably just outpoints her. And again, this is another fight that I strongly believe is going to decision, as the odds maker will agree with. Uh, and I don't have a ton of confidence in it, but it's just like we got to make a pick as far as all these fights go. We make a pick on every single fight just so people see where like the lean is at the very least. And the lean here would be Gloria De, pa- De Paula, just based on the volume, right? Just out, out, out. You don't have to outstrike her. You just got to outwork her, right? That's going to be the key here. And uh, and I think that she's capable of doing it. So sign me up. Yeah, it's not exactly rocket science. We're dealing with, you know, the three women's fights here. Yeah. They're over two and a half minus 450 for the Casey Aldrich fight. Over two and a half minus 400. And over two and a half minus 400. Like, for, they're all expected to go to decision. How do you win? Like, and neither, like, none of the people here have, like, a complete dominant grappling game, from what we can see, at least, uh, from, from here. So what ends up winning fights is volume. So... Uh, yeah, give me glory to Paulo as well, and just based on volume. You throw 26 strikes in two straight performances in the UFC, Jin Yu Fran. She's 35. Um, yeah. yeah, it's probably the end of the end of the line here. Uh, yeah, glory to Paula, likely by decision. And finally, we got Matthew Semmelsberger taking on Jason Witt, minus 120 Semmelsberger, plus 100 Witt. I mean, we were trying... <laughs> That was maybe one of the more embarrassing bets I had um, of 2020 was betting on Cole Williams against Jason oh. Witt. But uh, oh. d- I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. I still don't like just because he absolutely molly whopped Cole Williams, who came in six pounds heavy, looked like he didn't really train for the fight, wasn't exactly ready. Um, doesn't mean that I really think that Jason Witt has like massive upside here. But Semmelsberger was kind of gifted a, a decent little matchup against Carlton Minus, and he really didn't impress me very much as well. Do you have a hard lean on this one, or what? what's your take? No, it's not a hard lean by any stretch either way, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to go with Semi the Jedi, Matthew Semmelsberger, to get the job done. Um, listen, it, it, what we saw in the Carlton Minus fight, it's like, you know, it was pretty low level, and I don't think it screamed. Like, a lot of people, it's easy to gloss over that fight and forget about it, but he had done some decent work prior to coming to the UFC. Um, he's got nine pro fights. Eight of them have finished inside the distance. Both of his pro losses have also been inside the distance, but, you know, he's dangerous. He goes for it. He, he makes a work out of it. He fought Richard Petitionok before coming to the UFC. Petitionok, people will remember him from World Series of Fighting. He was like a poor man's Gracie killer for there for a little bit, getting a couple of victories. Uh, even fought Justin Gaethje. And ultimately, uh, you know, things didn't work out for him. But to knock him out in the first round with that elbow, and you rewatch the footage on it, like, yeah, Semmelsberg is a big, strong guy. He's also six foot one with a seventy-five inch reach. So for this weight class, I mean, he's got some good size to him. But again, yeah, you, you mentioned it. They were, they gifted him the fight with Carlton Minus, and even though he didn't look great, you know, he's a switch stance fighter, and he goes out and he lands, he knocks down Carlton Minus, right? He lands one hundred and eighteen significant strikes. He lands two takedowns and a submission attempt. He mm-hmm. worked him, man. He worked him in every facet of MMA. And prior to that fight, actually, I hadn't seen his wrestling at all. I didn't even know if it really existed or not. He's a guy that goes out there, likes to throw hands, is a good striker, but I yeah, just didn't really see much of his wrestling. I, Carlton Minus, it looked like he was at least willing to mix it in. And that's going to be important here because Jason Witt's a guy that can wrestle. And his best path to victory here is go out there and exactly what he did against Cole Williams. So the knock on Witt is even though he doesn't show a ton of knockout losses, it's like, this guy's been rocked a lot of times in his career. He's been hurt. He has been knocked out. Uh, you know, Justin Patterson knocked him out 13 seconds into the third. Hugh Pauly knocked him out. Uh, Takashi Sato it was 48 seconds into the first round. That was his UFC debut. Chance Ran counter knocked him out. Like, he's been knocked out half a dozen times on record. He's been rocked in a lot of these fights that he's, that he's won. Just doesn't have a very good chin. So here was the thing with the Cole Williams fight is that, yeah, I, I had a small shot on Cole and I just felt so bad of it because Cole's such a bum, released from the <laughs> UFC now. 
But it, like Cole, theoretically speaking, had a slight boxing advantage and wrestled. You know, the guys from Iowa, like the guy had wrestled in high school. He had wrestled a little bit collegiately. Like you know, fr- when he fought in Bellator back in the day, he was a wrestler. He fought Joe Riggs to a competitive decision and fight master. Like dude, dude had a couple assets. And then when he came to the UFC, he can't make weight. He routinely shows up in shape like a bag of milk and just gave a very poor account of himself all around. So Jason Wink goes out there and he styles on him. It's how he styled on him. He just took him down and grinded. And like, he's at Glory MMA and Fitness with James Krause and Tim Elliott. And we, we, we keep running that narrative of the guys coming with a good game plan. They lack certain skills, but they go in with a good game plan. Jason Witt, at this point, is striking. He can strike, but he's going to get caught. He's going to run into something. He's going to get hurt. It's going to turn the course of the fight. But the guy can wrestle. The guy was actually a decent wrestler back in the day. And you see what he did against Cole Williams and, it, you know, the fact that his ground game's improving. That's, that's what he's got to do against Semelsberg. He needs to go out there. He needs to take this guy down. He needs to grind him into the mat. Make, he needs to make this a wrestling match and hopefully bank some of these rounds. If this thing stays standing, Semelsberg is like three inches taller than him, two, three inches taller than him. He's got the longer reach. He's got the power. He's got the volume. I think he's going to work him over. But again, going back to Semelsberg's two pro losses, they're both by submission. And honestly, mm-hmm. that is a pass for Wit. Wit gets this fight to the ground. Wit's going to smash him up with elbows, just like he smashed um, he smashed Cole Williams bad with those elbows, busted him up, caused him to bleed, caused him to get tired, and choked him out. Like, the pass is there against Semmelsberger as well. So even though my natural reaction here is I'm going to take Semmelsberger to hopefully keep this fight standing, use that size, and use that striking, beat this guy down, use the volume, all of that, it's like if you're looking for an underdog, Jason Wynn is a live underdog here. He just needs to fight the appropriate game plan and hope he's got the three-round cardio to persevere. And that's the last thing. In the Williams fights, like, it didn't look like he was going away. You know, he was going to do that for three rounds all night if he didn't get the submission. His cardio looked good, and he just coasted a good game plan. Take the fight down, neutralize him, don't take a ton of risks, tire the guy out. That would work against Semmelsberg. It's whether or not he's able to actually go out there and put to good use. So, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I'm taking a coward's way out here and not just taking the straight-up shot on the underdog, but it's not like they're giving you a very good price on the underdog regardless. I mean, Jason Witt's only plus 100, right? So it's kind of a 50-50 fight. They're seeing that. If the fight stays standing, Semmelsberger wins it. If the fight hits the ground, Jason Witt win, wins it. Why wouldn't you want the grappler in a grappler versus striker battle? I just see, I just see Witt as he's had his chance. He's a little bit older now. He's been knocked out five times. You've seen the book on him. Where it's like Semmelsberger, yeah, he, he figures to still make some improvements. Like, who knows what he brings to the table, but... He seems to be in good shape, and you know, again, it's a 50-50 fight. I'm just gonna have to side with the with the younger, more active Matthew Semmelsberger. But I could I could see it going the other way if you're thinking of making Wit play, and, and I did nothing to convince you on the other side. Like, yeah, yeah I agree, Wit would be not the worst play in the world if you do go Jason Wit. And I just want to check this really quick here. But what's that Jason Wit by submission in specific? Uh, just I was because again, just did looking you look at, that? at it, Wit by submission plus four fifty. I was actually thinking about the uh, Semmels, Semmelsberger by KO plus three seventy five. Oh, uh, fuck! You know, okay, you know what? And this might be the greasiest way to look at it. If you take Semmelsberger by KO <laughs> and you also take Wit inside the distance, they're both three to one, and all you really need is this fight to not, not you know, end. You know, end inside the distance. Both mm-hmm. guys are capable of it. semmelsberger has been, like we said, pro, both pro losses been been finished. Wit, almost all of his pro losses, he's been finished. Right. So yeah, it screams that this is kind of probably going to be an under. It's probably going to be an inside the distance, and they're often using pretty juicy three to one money props on some of those uh, some of those finish methods. So d- most definitely worth a look, man. I don't know if Wade is some sort of like submission whiz. I think he just had a great night against a complete jobber. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, fair. You know that night. So if you're going to have Semmelsberger five inch reach advantage in this spot, I'm going to take a little little YOLO to get the night off to a to a hot start or you know start the night off with you know I, i'm trying to build back and get back to even like most of 2021 has seemingly been that way with uh luckily yawn bailed me out in the main event and kind of got my night back to even there took uh some dominic cruz by decision after round one that was minus 150 and then yawn or yawn blahovich after round three to win by decision because joe rogan was like gurgling all over Izzy Adesanya's nuts every single time he fainted. Uh, it was plus 800, which uh, got me out of... I, I had a couple too many spots last week, but uh, 
we wage on. I think, yeah, plus 375, Matthew Semmelsberger by knockout. I am not sold on Witt here. And, and you brought up some good points. Matthew Semmelsberger is still 28 years old, whereas Witt, you know, this is the guy at the end of the line more in his career. This is It's great that he got here at this point, but, like, I don't see too many more improvements happening for him. All right, we are just about out of time here. But before we go, Cody, hit him with the PRP. I'll have the PRP, but I want to just make mention real quick here that you were on point with a greasy theory last week saying that Adesanya might be a dog diddler. And when you see the judges' scorecards, those judges clearly love dogs. They were like, ah, 49, 46 at best. Like it was a, it was yeah. a complete blowout. There so was, yeah, outside was of no Joe Rogan, <laughs> everyone was no, on the same page. There was no 10-8. There was no 10-8 in that fight. That was pretty ridiculous. I agree with Dana when he was just like, I don't know what these judges are doing. Like, there was no 10-8. And the other fight with uh, Mara Bueno Silva, was that it? There was another yeah. one with, like, a 10-8 that they gave Mara Bueno Silva, I believe. Is that the fight I'm thinking of? So many fights. Or am yeah, I thinking of a well, different you never know. There was another fight on the card that, do. like, it didn't make any sort of sense that there was a 10-8. Yeah, it was... What, Marabuena Silva last week versus uh, De La Rosa, wasn't it? Sorry, let me just look this up. Now it's bothering that me. That was not last week. What was, sorry, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to multi-prop nah, this there's a, there's a, there's, Listen, there's a million fights and the judges don't exactly get it right. With the main event, yeah. No, all I'm saying is that you had the greasy theory that, uh, you know, his too. Instagram is questionable and it seemed like the judges agreed with that. But I'll hit you with the PRP really quick. Uh be nice to hit one of these fucking things and get back going. But all the same, we've had some bad bounces, that's for sure. Um, looking at this week, we're going to go with Leon Edwards, Ryan Spann, dog number one, Dan Ige, Jonathan Martinez, Matus Nicolau, dog number two, Darren Stewart, Angela Hill, Charles Jourdain, Rani Yaya, Nazareth Hakparas, Courtney Casey, dog number three, Gloria de Padula, and Matthew Semmelsberger. So we got three underdogs. We'll see how much the, this card keeps together. Hopefully, I, I actually like a lot of these spots. So hoping that it stays intact. Um, yeah, like, do I love this card from a betting standpoint? No, not necessarily. You can make a good case for all these underdogs, but I think just less is more. You know, people. I put out the part the parlay tweets every week. People want to see what's what's every pick. You know, what's what's this long parlay? I got a theory here. Not a theory. I think it's real life. People don't want to bet five dollars to win three bucks you know they want to win they want to bet five dollars to win two hundred dollars that's how people that's their instinct on betting it's the same thing with betting a, a slot you know you put 25 cents in or you put a nickel in you're you're not hoping to win three bucks you know you want to win a thousand dollars you want a hundred dollars so that's what we're doing we're chasing these long parlays but yeah less is more and a card like that is kind of the same thing every week it's like you know you get a couple good spots that you like and you put one guy too many you put one guy yeah you just put a little too much faith in them this is the same thing. I like Leon Edwards. I think Leon Edwards is parlay material for sure. I like Jonathan Martinez. Jonathan Martinez, you know, is he parlay material? Well, it's a, it's, he's fighting a grapple that could make things happen. He's not a very good price, but you're going to have to parlay the guy up. Then beyond that, it's like, who's who's safe for you, right? Is Angela Hill safe? No. Okay. Is uh, is Charles Jourdain safe? Jeez, man, I wouldn't really like it. Is Ronnie Yaya your guy? Is, is Ronnie Yaya safe? Like, I mean, I don't love it. So now you have a, you have a two-guy parlay. So I get greedy. I put a third guy on it. Maybe we'll put a fourth guy on it. We'll build over all of our parlays. Someone loses. But realistically, it's like, you know, if you just bet your two best picks, you know, if you just bet Amanda Nunez inside the distance parlayed with Islam Makachev, you know, you're going to win money. But nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants an even money play. They want to go for it. So as a result, you got to go for it. And this week, we'll be going for it. But yeah, bad luck can't keep a good man down forever, Paul. We'll get it going. And universally dude i don't think it's just us like we keep kind of sounding like we're feeling bad for ourselves but uh everybody's on the same place like everyone's getting killed like you know you you might have a good week this week and a bad week the next week you might have a good play on the co-main event but a bad play on the main event like it's gambling it's up and down right but uh we're gonna make one stick here i'm pretty confident in that and hopefully this is the week man all right sounds good yeah and to, to finish it off yeah it was uh maribu and silva versus uh uh, Montana De La Rosa, but two weeks ago, there was like a 10 8 that was given in that fight that I thought was kind of egregious. I know that, and and it wasn't because of the point taken away in round one. There was like one of the judges' scorecards. Either way, they're giving out a lot of 10 8s right now. So be ready in like live markets for, for draws if, if there's something borderline and the odds are like kind of crazy. Like you got to be, 
Like when they start offering like 12 to 15 to 1 and you're like, ah, judges could have scored that a 10-8 if they're getting a little bit greasy with it. When they go down to like 5 to 1 or below on these on those draw bets, not really worth it. But there could be a little advantage there. If these judges continue to be handing out 10-8s uh, like candy, there could be a little bit of value. Any any final thoughts, Cody, or should we, should we get yeah. out of here? Yeah, just so just final thought really quick. I mean, you make a great point. Live betting market is kind of where the money's at right now. I mean, that's that's been the biggest change. Normally, right, we used to have these cards, and they were a little more sporadic, right? But you would get the lines week of the fight, right? They would drop these lines. Here's the card this weekend. You know, you you know, what were we recording? We were recording on Tuesdays, Bookie Beatdown, and there was oftentimes it was like the lines aren't out yet. So we're sitting around twiddling our thumbs till 5 o'clock. So they would release lines on a Tuesday, for a card happening on a Saturday. You find these great spots, right? Mm -hmm. The bookie set these lines out. And the same thing, the underdog's hitting at a 40% clip this year. So if all you do, just if you just quite simply bet every single underdog, every single card, you'd be crushing it this year. You'd be, you'd be very up, very profitable. But it's now that they release them two, three weeks in advance, there's steam, there's more time, there's more maturity, more money is coming in. Things have worked themselves out. The live betting market is back to the old Wild West days. That bitch opens up really quick. There's a limited window of time to capitalize on it, mm -hmm. but the lines, are, the lines would be off. So you make a great point in the Jan Blockwitz fight. By the third round, you knew that fight was going the distance, right? You knew that fight was going the distance by the third round. By already, the third yeah. round, it was like, Jan's very competitive in this fight. He's probably winning the striking, and at some point, he could just take the fight down. Mm -hmm. He wins four or five, plus 800 by Jan absurd. Blockwitz by decision. But absurd. Michael Johnson versus Clay Guida, okay? He lost the first two rounds. He was minus 150. Like, how is this possible? Yeah. But it's like, well, the second round was close. No, all three judges scored that fight 30-27 for Clay Guida. So you were, you, you were betting on him knocking out Clay Guida in which he had shown no indication he was going to do at any point in that fight. But it's live, right? So you can do the show and you can pick Israel Adesanya and Michael Johnson. Yeah, well, at the end of the day, you're an idiot. But... You can also wait for that live betting spot and things become more clear. So yeah. that's a huge trend in 2021 is like you can make your pre-fight bet. People love making those pre-fight bets, but you got to be on it, man. You got to be sharp. You can't, And you can't even be watching watching an illegal stream because if it's 25 seconds, if it's 45 seconds yeah, off, matters. fucking right, it matters. You got to be on it, right? So that's, that's a huge thing. But we do pre-fight shows. You know, eventually maybe we do during fights. That's so hard to commit to. But I would love, I'd love to do at least one show where it's like you got to watch it right up to date, right up to time, and it's like break it down from a live betting standpoint. But, you know, people got shit to do on Saturday nights as well, I understand. So, yeah. Anyways, regardless, that's the last point is keep your eyes for those live betting markets, and uh, good luck to everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Let's, uh, let's get after it. And we've been uh, we've been toying with the idea. I've been working on it actually behind the scenes. Nobody, nobody even knows this, but... Uh, Working on like making a little Discord, so maybe or let us know in the comment section if you'd be interested in that Discord because it's like live, up to date. That you could kind of chat with people. The problem with like a YouTube show live and trying to give people live bets is that by the time YouTube uh, transmits it, it's like thirty seconds behind um, what's live. So if I say something on the show during that, like it's literally you have like a thirty second window to hit like some of these like buy decision props and stuff like that. Uh, in a live fight. So it just wouldn't work that way. But uh, in a Discord, I think it could potentially. And yeah, frankly, right now, um, my pre-bets have been, you know, hurting for certain. But I've been bailing myself out in the live windows. Uh, it's been the return of lives. And there was that one week where they didn't have any of the by decision props. And I was like, oh, no, this is the only thing that has been. They uh, caught on. It's the only thing that's been working for me in 20. Please don't be gone. So. Thank God that uh, that is it. Anyway, that is it for us this week. Hope you enjoyed this show. For Cody Saftik, I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Ow, ow, ow.